Right guys, welcome back to A-Level Attachment. This is lesson six, and in this video we are going to be covering Bowlby's theory of attachment. The second theory of attachment that we're going to be covering, with the first one being learning theory. If you haven't watched that video yet, or if you feel like you need a little bit of a recap, the link should be on your screen now, so you can go and check that out if you feel like you need to. So as usual, we're going to start with the outline points of the theory, and then we are going to move on to a couple of evaluations. We're going to finish off with an example six mark outline so that you can also see how all of this would look in an essay. So John Bowlby rejected the learning theory of attachment because he figured that if it were true, then infants should readily attach to any adult that regularly feeds them, which we know isn't the case. So instead, Bowlby took his inspiration from the work of people like Lorenz and Harlow, and he suggested an evolutionary theory of attachment. A theory that sees attachment as an innate process that provides a survival advantage. Bowlby suggested that, like imprinting, attachment evolved because it ensures infants stay close to their caregivers, which protects them from danger whether that was predators 100,000 years ago, or traffic and electricity today. Now there are several elements to the theory, all of which we are going to go through in this video. You've got monotropy, social releases, critical periods, and the internal working model. All this theory is often described as monotropic, and that's because he placed a huge emphasis on a child's attachment to one particular caregiver. And he believed that that attachment to their caregiver was different and more important than any other attachment that they were going to form in their lives. Although Bowlby generally referred to this person as the mother, it doesn't have to be the biological mother. It's the infant's primary attachment figure, whether that's mother, father, auntie, uncle, grandma, whatever, it doesn't matter. And Bobby said that the more time spent with this primary attachment figure, the better. He outlined two laws or two principles to emphasize this idea. The first one is the law of continuity, and it states that the more constant and the more predictable a child's care is, the better quality the attachment will be. And the law of accumulated separation suggests that every bit of time away from the mother all adds up. And so the safest amount of time to spend away from the mother is zero. Moving on, Bowlby also suggests that infants are born with a set of innate, cute behaviours. And these can be physical, but also behavioural. Things like smiling, cooing, and gripping onto things. And these behaviours encourage attention from adults, and their purpose is to activate the adult attachment system. And they make the adults feel love towards the infant. Okay, so those behaviours trigger an innate predisposition in adults to become attached. And these behaviours are called social releases, because they release or trigger social behaviour in the adult. Bowlby also proposed the idea of a critical period of around six months. Now this is a time frame when the infant attachment system is most active and most sensitive to attachment formation. According to Bowlby, this critical period can technically be classed as a sensitive period because it can reach up to around two years, but the general idea is that if an attachment is not formed during this time, it'll be much harder to form one later in life, and a failure to form this attachment can lead to irreversible consequences in terms of intellectual, social, emotional, and psychological development. And then as a final element, we have the concept of the internal working model. Bowlby said that children form a mental representation of their relationship with their primary caregiver, which he called the internal working model. And it serves as a model for what all relationships are like. It can therefore have a huge impact on the child's future relationships. 
For example, a child whose first experience is of a loving relationship with a reliable caregiver is more likely to be loving and reliable in a relationship themselves, and is more likely to expect these qualities from that relationship. The opposite is also true, of course. A child whose first experience involves poor treatment will tend to form further poor relationships in the future, in which they treat others and expect to be treated in that way. Perhaps most importantly, the internal working model also affects people's ability to parent themselves. Because, as a general rule, people tend to base their parenting behaviour on their own experience of being parented which can explain why children from functional families tend to have functional families of their own, because you tend to replicate your first attachment when you yourself become a parent. Okay, so those are the outline points for Bowlby's theory of attachment. Obviously, when we get towards the end of the video, we'll put all of those together into a six mark outline so that you can see what it would look like and see how all of those points kind of come together. For now though, let's have a look at a couple of evaluation points. I've got four for you, two strengths and one and a half limitations. So we'll start with some support for the internal working model. In 2007, Bailey et al. tested the idea that patterns of attachment are passed on through generations due to the internal working model. To do that, they used 99 mothers and their one-year-old infants and they measured the mother's attachments to their own primary attachment figure, as well as the attachment quality of the babies. And they found that mothers with poor attachments to their own primary attachment figure were more likely to have poorly attached babies themselves. And that supports the idea that a mother's ability to form attachments to their babies is influenced by their internal working model, which is exactly what Bowlby's theory predicts. However, it does also have to be said that Bowlby probably ignored the influence of other factors that can impact our ability to parent and that can impact our social development and so on. So some psychologists believe that genetic differences in things like anxiety and social ability also affect social behaviour in babies and adults. These differences could then also impact parenting ability. Okay, so somebody who is genetically slightly more anxious or genetically slightly more shy or something like that, that could impact both a baby's behaviour because you get shy babies and you get more introverted babies as well as outgoing babies, but it will obviously also impact um, somebody's parenting ability as well. So that means that Bowlby may have overstated the importance of the internal working model in social behaviour and parenting and may have ignored other factors such as biology and genetics. Another limitation of the theory is that the evidence for monotropy is still very mixed. So Bowlby believed that this first attachment was special and unique, and that only after it had been established would the infant be able to form multiple attachments. But Schaffer and Emerson, in their study of Glaswegian babies, found that although most babies attached to one person first, there was a significant minority who were able to form multiple attachments at the same time. So they didn't form one attachment first, they actually attached to multiple caregivers rather than just to one. It's also unclear whether there is something unique about that first attachment. It does appear to have a particularly strong influence on later life, however, it could simply mean that this particular attachment is stronger rather than different in quality, because any attachment that you form as an infant is going to bring with it the same important key behaviours, emotional support, secure base, all of that kind of stuff. So whether it's actually different in quality is still unclear. So that means that Bowlby may be incorrect in that there's a unique quality and importance to the child's primary attachment, and that, together with Schaffer and Emerson, actually challenges a central concept of the theory, and that is the concept of monotropy. And as a final piece of research support, we have Brazelton et al., who provided evidence that cute baby behaviours are designed to elicit interactions from their caregivers. 
So as part of their research, they observed babies trigger interactions with adults using social releases. And what they actually did was they instructed the primary attachment figure to ignore the baby's social releases and pretend like they weren't there. And they found that previously responsive babies became increasingly distressed and some of them actually just curled up and laid motionless on the floor as a result. So that illustrates the role of social releases in emotional development and it does show that they're important in the process of attachment development. Okay, so those were your four evaluation points. I'm now just going to quickly finish off by putting everything together into a six mark outline so that you can see how it would all fit in. So as normal, I would suggest starting with an introductory sentence. For this one, I would suggest that you talk about the fact that Bowlby took an evolutionary approach to explaining attachment. You can use keywords like innate and survival to show an examiner that you know what you're talking about. In my second paragraph, I have put in the concept of monotropy, critical period, and social releases. I've given a little bit of detail on all of them. You can see that I've given a little bit more detail to the critical period, but it doesn't really matter how you do it. I will just kind of put them all into that particular paragraph. And then I will dedicate one final paragraph to the internal working model. And there is definitely quite a lot to say about it. Okay, the one thing that you need to be a little bit aware of is that this outline is traditionally a fairly long outline. There's quite a lot to say and everything seems quite important. So I would definitely practice writing this under time conditions and I would see if you can actually get it all down in around 10 minutes. If you're taking more than 10 minutes consistently to write this outline, then I would start to consider which bits you could potentially take out. So, for example, this sentence here that I've highlighted for you is one that you could potentially remove. It's not the most important sentence, and it is definitely a sentence that just is designed to add a little bit of extra detail. Um, so you could take that out if you wanted to. Okay. So that is the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense and I hope it's been useful. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next one.